are going to listen to a conversation between two people, a customer and a representative of a company which rents cars. There are three alternative answers, A, B and C, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the appropriate letter. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now the test will begin. Remember, you will hear the recording only once, so answer the questions as you listen. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Carline. So that we can best help you, can you please press the star button on your phone now? Thank you. Now choose one of the following four options by pressing the buttons on your telephone. Press 1 if you would like to make a car reservation. Press 2 if you would like to talk to someone about a car reservation. Press 3 if you would... Please hold while we put you through to one of our assistants. Good morning, Melanie speaking. How can I help you? My name is Mr. Maxine, and I booked a car several days ago to be picked up from Heathrow Airport in London, and I'd like to change the booking. I see. Have you got a reference? Yes, I have it here somewhere on a piece of paper. Uh, ah, here it is. It's A for Alpha, C for Charlie, F for Foxtrot, Y for... Yeah. Yes. The number of 15, uh, 1, 5, A for Alpha, and G for Go. Let's see. Can I just check that? A, C, F, Y, 15, A, G. Yes. Mr. John Maxine. Yes, that's it. OK, so how can I help you? I booked a car for three days from this Friday at 6 p.m. to Monday at 6 p.m. Yes, a manual. I'd like to change it for a larger car and an automatic rather than a manual. And I'd also like to book it for five rather than three days. OK, let's have a look. Mm, we have an estate which is automatic. Yes, that would be perfect. There is a difference in price, though. For the extra two days? Yes, but also for the size of the car. The estate is £15 more expensive per day than the saloon car you have already booked. OK. And how much extra is it altogether, then? Um, that makes it an extra £165. Hmm. It seems rather expensive. Uh, the last time I hired one, it wasn't so much. When was that? Um, several weeks ago. I see. Before the speakers continue their conversation, look at questions 7 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the dialogue, complete the numbered spaces 7 to 10. Write no more than two words or a number for each space. Well, it's basically because the rates change daily according to the cars available. The estate is the last automatic we have for hire for that period. 
We have a manual estate, which is cheaper, if that would help. No, it has to be an automatic. OK. Shall I debit your card for the extra £165? Is it possible for me to pay the extra in cash when I pick up the car at the airport? I'm afraid that isn't possible, as there are no facilities for handling cash at that time of the day. <sighs> that seems odd. It's because the money can't be banked in the evening, and for security reasons, no cash is held on the premises. OK, you can debit my card. You'll have to give the number to me again. Isn't it logged on the screen? For security reasons, it doesn't come up on the screen when we look at the booking. Any changes, and it has to be entered again. I see. It's three double four five double nine double one. Three double four five double nine double one. Double four two five. Double four two five. Double seven five zero. Double seven five zero. Okay, that has now been authorized. Shall we send the receipt to your Park Vale address? Yes, uh, number 40. Is there anything else I can help you with, Mr. Maxine? No, nothing else, thank you. Have a nice trip. Thank you. Goodbye. That's the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You are going to hear a radio program about sport. First, look at questions 11 to 14. For these questions, listen carefully and circle the correct letters. And now for our Mystery Personality of the Week and your chance to win one of our fabulous prizes. Last week's competition generated a huge response and the first five answers pulled out of the bag will receive a hundred pounds worth of sports clothes vouchers. And if you didn't win last week, here's another chance. And this week's prize is even bigger. We're giving away ten prizes of £250 worth of book, music and clothes vouchers to mark the first anniversary of the show on the air. So get your pens ready to take down the address details. Just write the name of the person you think is our mystery personality and send it to Mystery Draw at the address Marcia will give you in just a second. The address will be repeated at the end of the show for those of you who didn't get it. And so it's over to Marcia, who will tell you a few tantalising details about our mystery person this week. Thanks, Mike. Well, here goes. Our mystery person this week is a very well-known footballer who plays for a famous club and has also played for his national team. He is very talented and is enormously popular especially for the part he played in a famous footballing victory. And two clues. He hasn't got a famous wife, and he speaks French. If you think you know who it is, then pop the answer on a postcard and send it to Mystery Draw, P.O. Box 5110, London SE1 5LE. That's P.O. Box 5110. And please don't forget to write your name and address too. And now it's back to Mike. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20.
As you listen to the second part of the sports program, answer questions 15 to 20. For questions 15 to 19, write no more than two words or a number for each answer. For question 20, circle the correct letter. Thank you, Marcia. Get those postcards in and make this a bumper anniversary draw. Now, if you remember, last week on the show, we talked to the organiser of a new group set up to help young people up to the age of 20 to get involved in activities like horse riding, tennis, scuba diving, cycling, or any form of sport which involves some kind of expense. John Tebbit, the organiser, rang us to say that the response to his appeal on the show was staggering. A large number of people, both young and old, have offered their services free as volunteers. The whole thing has been overwhelming. John said that they had also had numerous offers of help throughout the country to use facilities free of charge. As if that was not enough, they've received many donations, including several rather large gifts of more than £5,000. On behalf of John Tebbit, and also of those who will benefit from the generous gifts to the Trust, I would like to say thank you. This week, we're going to talk to a very unusual athlete indeed. Patrick, who is 20 years of age, has been wheelchair-bound for the past five years after a motorcycle accident left him paralysed from the waist down. This has not stopped this young man from getting out and about. He's an inspiration to all of us. Patrick has excelled in archery, beating the best in the field, so much so that he has won sponsorship from leading sports manufacturers, which has now enabled him to devote more time to perfecting his skills. So I would like to introduce you to Patrick, who is going to tell us what this sponsorship means to him. That's the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Excuse me, Dr Owen, I... Oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question and I was wondering if I could change my paper to Investment in Knowledge comparing some European countries with the United States and then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average. I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals. Hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested, and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, 
Could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material? When you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through is the IT department section on the university site, which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll tick that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock, it's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it. And we'll just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the work of a printing department at a university. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I am here to give you a brief outline of the work of this new department. The Department of the Printed Word has a very short history, having been created just ten years ago. Some statistics to start with. The first intake of undergraduate students consisted of 20 students, which rose to 37 in the second year, and we now have about 50 in the first year, doing a wide range of courses full and part-time. We have a thriving research department with 17 students on the taught MA course and 7 students doing research full-time. In all, we have 9 full-time lecturers and 16 part-time lecturers who work mainly but not exclusively in our evening department. Of the total student body, approximately 21% are from outside the country, a number which has been increasing steadily over recent years. Although students from overseas have to reach a minimum level of competence in English before they follow a course at the university, some may require remedial help with their English, and we can offer help through the student support services as part of the general assistance given to all students. For home students, both graduate and undergraduate, there are bursaries to help with travel and accommodation, for which I would advise you to contact Mrs. Riley at the end of this session. Increasingly, we are forging external links with organisations in the publishing world, and we have been very fortunate in that we have received money to sponsor not just various students within the department, but also technicians and lecturers. Each year we hold a series of lectures which are given by external speakers in the world of printing and the media. The series of workshops that you see around you have been built thanks to a very generous donation which has allowed us to develop our facilities for bookbinding and restoration. Now, the main work of the department relates to teaching the mechanism of printing. And as most printing is now so highly technological, all our students have to be computer literate. For those of you who are interested in taking a module in this department from another department and who feel that you may not have the necessary computer skills, don't let the technology put you off. We have a number of specialist technicians who can support and deliver crash programs in the computing technology required. As long as you can switch on the computer, you are halfway there. We have what can only be called state-of-the-art facilities, especially for those wishing to move into the publishing world, working not just as printers, but also in editing, page design, layout and bookbinding. With the extensive facilities we have for book restoration, some of our former students are now employed as expert book restorers and conservationists, skills which were once almost dying out. In the display you will notice samples of work on book cover design and as well as having all the necessary computer programs for dealing with printing we have some old printing presses. Despite being largely a modern department we do have an increasing interest in research into the history of the printed word ranging from early European to Chinese and Japanese printing techniques. We have in fact some very well-known experts on early printing in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. If this area appeals to you, you can talk to Dr. Fred Clare afterwards. From China, we're lucky to have as a visiting lecturer Dr. Yu, who is an authority on early Chinese manuscripts and printing machines. If you are thinking about doing a module with us, or you are interested in doing research after you have finished your first degree, the person to talk to is Professor Clarkson, who will be able to give you all the details. For postgraduate research, you should really be thinking about applying now, even though we are only in December, as the department now attracts large numbers of people, and we always have many applications for each research position. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.